Hey everyone, I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI, and uh, this is an InterNACHI webinar. We do free live online webinars, open to everyone. You don't have to be a home inspector, you can just join in. And uh, today we're doing a webinar, it's unique. We're, we have four master inspectors um, in four different locations, inspecting four uh, HVAC systems, and, um, and feel free to ask questions if you're attending the uh, webinar live. Um, there's probably a little question box. Uh, you can tap that and ask your questions or a little chat box if you're watching this on um, uh, YouTube live. Uh, you can ask your questions there. What we're gonna do is a round robin. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask each inspector to provide us about 10 to 15 minutes worth of their inspection tips their process on how they inspect a heating system that they're in front of. Um, you don't have to follow their tasks. Um, it's really what they're sharing on how they uh, do their home inspections and inspect the HVAC systems um, in their own way. There is a standard though. Uh, it's the International Home Inspection Standards and we'll get to that in just a second. But um, we have with us International Certified Professional Inspectors, Daniel Cullen, Charles Belafontaine, Mark Stengel, and Rob Klaus. And uh, according to um, the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, oh, wait, I wanted to share you a couple URLs. So we're at nachi.org slash webinars. Um, that's N-A-C-H-I dot org slash webinars. And if you need help with anything with uh, training or online courses or InterNACHI, um, feel free to email the education team at InterNACHI, that's at InterNACHI, uh, education at InterNACHI.org, education at InterNACHI.org. And I also wanted to share with you some home inspection checklists. So it's a really long URL and I apologize for that, but it's at NACHI.org slash home hyphen inspection hyphen checklist. And if you go there, we provide a bunch of checklists that you could use. There's a home inspection checklist, there's a gas furnace inspection checklist, there's a pool and spa checklist, there's a radon mitigation inspection uh, checklist, it goes on and on and on. And if you take a look at the gas furnace inspection checklist, first thing that pops up is the standards of practice. And according to the Internet G Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the home inspector is required to inspect the heating system using normal operating controls. The inspector shall describe the location of the thermostat of the system, the energy source, and the heating method. The inspector shall inspect readily accessible and visible, visible portions of the chimney connected to the heating system where applicable, and the inspector shall report as in need of correction any heating system that didn't operate and if the heating system was deemed inaccessible. And those terms, accessible and readily accessible and inaccessible, are actually defined in the standards of practice and also our um, glossary. And if you go through the checklist at that URL, you'll see a checklist on how to perform a gas furnace inspection. And I recommend taking a look at that checklist and go through it. And if you have a mobile device, you can keep that checklist with you as you perform an inspection. So you, I, well, I do that so I can look smarter and I don't make any mistakes. So there's that URL there, natchiorg slash home inspection checklist. And the first person up that we have is Charles. And um, let's see, Charles is there and I'm gonna stop to my screen. Yeah, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Yep, I think so, Charles. Terrific, so my name is Charles Belfontaine, I prefer Charlie. I've been doing home inspections since I think around 1993. Um, we did open up a school here in Illinois and I don't know what else there is to it. I just love looking at houses and talking about this stuff. I'm a little bit of a nerd. So my home, I do have a basically less than two year old high efficiency furnace. And that's what's shown in the background. Um, when we do our home inspections, we're a little bit more I should say technically exhaustive than it comes to most. So the biggest problem we're always gonna find with the forced air furnace is the cracked heat exchanger or a hole in the heat exchanger, something that makes this thing unsafe that we wanna do it. So one of the first things that I'm gonna look at is down underneath in the blower fan. 
So if you can get under this area here and shine a flashlight on there, that should be dry. Now, this isn't gonna be a telltale sign that there's a hole or a crack in the heat exchanger, but if there's rust, condensation, or anything else there, it shouldn't be there. So it could come from the humidifier overflowing, it could come from the air conditioning overflowing. What we don't want it to come from is a hole in the secondary heat exchanger. And usually you're gonna get the condensation that absorbs into that and then that eats away at the secondary heat exchanger and drips down on the floor. So if everything's dry, just a fantastic um, sign with it. Then we're also gonna, see if I can do this right, way up there is the uh, blower door cutoff switch. And you could probably see it, nah, I'm not gonna be able to do that. But all the way in the upper uh, left of your screen on the furnace, you see that white little switch on there. Make sure those are connected. Um, if you're calling for heat, obviously it shouldn't start up when that door's off. That's kind of the simple things. Then we open up the top and I have to put the blower door back on, otherwise the unit isn't gonna run. Um, for me, I'm you know, kind of particular, you know, I like to, people should know how all the different parts on these things and the sequence of the startup. And as long as you know what it's supposed to do, when something's not right, you're gonna be able to start diagnosing and figure out what's going on or what might be broken. You know, I'm always one to wanna to know more. So the steps of operation and also the components that are in here, I think are important. So the first thing that's gonna happen, our thermostat is gonna call for heat. Once that happens, then right in here is our inducer fan. That's gonna start spinning. Once that inducer fan starts spinning, it's gonna create a positive pressure in the exhaust over here, negative pressure inside the heat exchanger. Down lower, we have these pressure switches down here. This particular furnace has two pressure switches. One of them goes to the inducer fan and the other one goes to the secondary heat exchanger. I should be making a positive pressure in one and a negative pressure in the other. So backing up a little bit. Thermostat calls for heat. The computer says, yeah, let's start turning the furnace on. The inducer fan starts spinning. The computer doesn't know if the fans are broken or the motor's burnt out. So it needs to have some way to verify that draft is being created. Those pressure switches that are on there, they basically, they'll flip and that way the computer knows that it's ready to go. Once it gets past that stage, then up at the top is where my burners are and we're gonna have a silicon igniter up there. The next stage is it's gonna start glowing orange. They usually let, the computer lets that happen for about five, 10 seconds. Then it turns on the, the um, gas valve and starts sending gas up in there. There's also gonna be a flame sensor in there or some sort of thermocouple up in there, something to verify that that gas is ignited. That's also sends a signal back to the computer saying, okay, we're good up to this stage and keep moving forward. If we didn't make a fire, then obviously the whole furnace would shut down. The next step is after that is the blower fan kicks on and that's gonna start circulating air to the house. One of the things we look at is the data plate on these things and I look for that temperature rise. And a simple turkey thermometer, you could put it up in the plenum <laughs> and start taking those readings. And let me go back and switch to the main furnace. So this would be taken way up there, um, usually where the humidifier is, or you could find an opening where the um, air conditioning lines come into it. Um, and that's gonna have a reading. Usually it's a 30 degree spread. So depending on the furnace, it'll be like 25 to 55 or 40 to 70, whatever it is. So if it's 70 degrees in the house and I got a 30 to 60 rise, it should be anywhere from 100 to 130 degrees up in there. And these furnaces are designed that as much heat as it's created, it's gonna pull that heat out of the furnace and send it into the room. So if all of a sudden it starts getting higher than at 130 degrees, one of the first things I like to check for is the air filter. So I'm gonna pull that out if the unit is running. Well, I wanna look at it anyway, just to make sure it's clean. But if my temperatures start dropping down, that's actually a good sign where it comes with it. Um, if they don't, well, then there's a possibility that our blower fan's on the wrong speed or maybe our air conditioning coil is clogged. Um, that could just end up being a lot of other problems. Other sensors, you know, so way in the back, right above the 
you'll see a couple lines going in there and there's gonna be a square little thermostat or sensor in there. That's gonna be my high limit sensor. That's also gonna indicate on the data plate when that turns the furnace on. Most of them are somewhere between 165 and 185 degrees. I've seen some of them up to 190. Um, but nonetheless, if the temperature gets up to that high, then the whole unit shuts down. So if you have a hole in the heat exchanger, if my blower fan's not working, if I have a clog in the air conditioning coil, my air filter is restricting flow, these are all things that slow the airflow going over the top and can cause it to overheat and come in there. Shutdown is kind of in reverse. The first thing that shuts down is gonna be our flame. The inducer fan keeps going. We're gonna let the furnace cool down to somewhere around 100 degrees. After that point, there's just not enough usable heat you know, to send through the room. So as long as that metal is intact, we're good. I like to add on before I check for time on this, is there's kind of three different safety things that are built into a furnace. And by no means does it mean that if you have one bad thing, you can ignore the others, all right? But let's say the first thing is gonna be our gas air mixture. If that's you know, in good shape, then we're gonna be producing hardly any carbon monoxide whatsoever. Um, if it's a bad gas there and we get high levels of carbon monoxide, then obviously if we have a hole or crack, that can come into the breathing air as well. Number two is going to be the heat exchanger itself. So we're going to have the fire inside the metal box, inside the heat exchanger. We're going to blow air outside the heat exchanger. As long as all that's intact, then there's no way for the carbon monoxide again to get into the circulation air. And then the third safety feature is gonna be our pressure differentials. So since we're gonna have an inducer fan creating a negative pressure inside the heat exchanger, because that blower fan is after the fire, after the heat exchanger, um, that's gonna create a negative pressure inside. And then the blower fan is before the heat exchanger and that's on the outside of the heat exchanger. So if I do have a hole, um, air is going to be flowing into the heat exchanger instead of carbon monoxide coming out of the heat exchanger. Sometimes you can look at the flames. If the hole is way up high by the, the tubes or the flames themselves where the heat exchanger is, sometimes that flame will flicker or do something weird. I, truthfully, with these monoport burners, I, I would never be able to recognize that. Um, we take it a step further in our company. We use combustion analyzers. Um, we know what the oxygen levels are going to be. We know what the gas level should be when they come to the end of it. Um, and then we run those things. If you like, I could go ahead and do that, but it'll take about a minute. So I could always do that later um, after somebody else has a chance. I did see yeah. one question underneath there, Ben. I don't yep. know if you yeah. read it at all. Yeah, maybe do the combustion analyzer later if we have time. And John asks, um, do you test the heating system in the summertime? I do. You know, there's, it's an inconvenience. You know, that's about it. But um, to me, this is one of the big expensive items in a home. You know, so I'm pretty aggressive when it comes to the furnace, foundation, and the heating system, quite frankly. So, yes, I do. Air conditioning, we don't because we get cold temperature here. Um, and let me rephrase it. Air conditioning, we don't test in the colder weather. Um, just because we don't want to take a chance of pushing liquid through the compressor. So, so when do you draw that line for winter time? And, and you know what? The going thing around here is 65 degrees. I think it's pretty conservative, but I don't want to buy an air conditioner. So we're going to go with the conservative number of 65 degrees. Cool. And what is the category, uh, furnace category behind you? Is it low, yeah. mid, high? It's a high efficiency category four furnace, which means that it's a condensing furnace. So usually we're gonna create somewhere between three and 500 degrees worth of heat. And we're gonna capture 95% of that heat. 95% of the heat is gonna go inside the house. So 5% is gonna be sent out that plastic pipe. Yep. Because we have such a great temperature change, we will be creating condensation, all right? That condensation is very caustic. Um, one of the reasons why we have to use plastic pipes and not metal pipes, because if somebody did try to put a metal pipe on this, and I have seen it once, that condensation will eat through that in about a year or two. 
and usually by the time we get there, it's already eaten through. And then you're dumping carbon monoxide straight into the house. Obviously, that's a problem. So it needs to be plastic. One more thing, too. Yep. On the bottom of the floor is where my condensate collector is, right underneath here. Yep. That yellow hose that you see going across. So that's collecting condensation from the secondary heat exchanger that's also pouring into there. And then that goes to a floor drain. It's not customary here in Chicago that we put any neutralizers or anything like that. We just kind of send everything straight into it. I don't know if that's customary in other parts of the country, but not here. Right? Yeah. That's pretty common not to neutralize it, go through all that. Cool. Hey, Charles, appreciate it. And again, if anybody has any questions, um, we'll try to answer them as we go. I think Mark, you're up next. I'm ready. All right, show us what you got. All right, well, <clears throat> This is my uh, simpler system. It's a 80% efficient uh, forced air gas furnace. Uh, originally installed when I purchased this house six years ago. It has some common elements to Charles' system and uh, we've added a few other things to it, but initially we have an inducer fan that comes on and unlike uh, Charles' system, we have a conventional chimney that uh, goes from single vent to B vent all the way up to the roof through another story. And uh, we always check our furnace vents very carefully. Uh, that's one thing that we, we like to do. We, look at, we do a roof inspection on a regular home. We check the vents for rust and leakage. And we often find that they've been, they're deteriorated, need to be replaced and upgraded in older homes. Uh, this furnace uh, has the same kind of, I've already removed this front cover. And here you see the burners. And in this area, you see the control system. And uh, it's not uh, on now because you have the safety interlock switches here that uh, turn everything off when you pull up this cover. So uh, what I'm gonna do is fire this thing up uh, in just a second, go up and show you the thermostat. And uh, here we have uh, an April Air steam injection system. And that's one thing we've added to uh, enhance our uh, perception of warmth in this Colorado climate, we inject steam into the system when the, the furnace is running. And that humidifies the house, and we like to keep it about 35%. And it keeps you, it keeps you feeling warmer. So at this point, I'm gonna go upstairs and turn on the thermostat. Sure. So essentially, you've got a humidifier, but it's actually creating steam. Yeah, it and makes steam, it's, it. an electric, uh, it's an electric steam. Yep. Uh, humidifier and it has a cartridge that's replaced every so many years depending on your your uh, concentration of uh, uh, contaminants in your water. Yep and different so, from Charles's heating system uh, you had a category one uh, not a high efficiency. No 80 percent efficient and it's pretty much the second generation and here I'm turning up my thermostat to 72 uh, in the house now and I'm turning it up to, uh, trying to turn it up to, uh, it doesn't want to go above 70 for some reason. Hmm. Well, I'll, I'm gonna circumvent the control system. Oh, those darn electric high efficiency thermostats, I hate them. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're smarter than we are. We wanna run, some people like to keep their house very warm. So <laughs> at this point, I'm gonna go grab a, fortunately I'm in my uh, workshop lab area here and I can get a, a clip lead in. The uh, connector is exposed to run the humidifier. And uh, I'm going to now clip lead uh, these two connectors here. Uh, and we'll get down to do that, and we'll start the furnace up, and we'll go through the cycles of operation. So you're going to do something that a home inspector would never do. This is only because I'm doing this now, and my thermostat is is way too smart for me. <laughs> and I would never. Uh, I have done this when the thermostat is bad to do a quick test on carbon monoxide. Yep. But always stood by. Now here, my furnace is starting. The inducer fan has started. 
uh, setting up the artificial draft as uh, Charles system does. And uh, the previous generation of furnaces that was out there, the uh, 60 percenters, and even before that, the 60 percenters did not have that. They would start and they would have to have a natural draft. Now, here you can see the igniter getting ready to ignite, the, uh, heating up. It's a hot, hot service igniter. And uh, those sometimes do go out. That's a maintenance issue. And then here is the furnace running and the hot air is going up through that fan you see up above. Now, one of the next things that I do after I've verified that the flames are operating, uh, burning correctly. And of course, in this furnace, you can check for any dust accumulation or, or dirt buildup, and I always look for that as well. I have here a carbon monoxide sensor that I use frequently. It's a, uh, can you see this one okay? Yep, yep. Um, and uh, I carry this with me, it's like a dose meter. But once the burner starts, once the uh, fan comes on, and I hear it coming on now, I'll go to a heat vent and I'll, uh, it only has to run for a few seconds, for about 10 seconds actually. Here's one in here and the hot air is already coming out. And you can see um, uh, the sensor opening is right there and there's also a tube you can put on there as well. You let this run for about a minute and then you're able to determine if there's a carbon monoxide level and I'm still at zero now and I'm, I've tested this system many times, so I'm assured that it's uh, burning properly and there's no leaks in a heat exchanger. But one other thing that is good to do, I'm turning this off now, is that when the system shuts down, sometimes you'll have backflow of carbon monoxide come through, come down into the chimney and uh, exhaust into the heating room and you get some indication of uh, the efficiency and the performance of the chimney and the blower system once that happens. And it's gonna shut down and now it's going through the cooling cycle. Again, this, this furnace has uh, a, a diaphragm system here that makes sure that the fan is operating correctly when it does. And then we also have the burner system itself to ignite it also has its own safety system that will not allow the system to, go, to move forward and ignite if it's not operating correctly. And then in this furnace, you can see two little red and green lights beeping and there's a legend on the front of the furnace and that tells me that everything is operating normally. Hmm. So uh, based on, uh, on this you know, indication, I'm saying this furnace is in good, safe operating condition. What was the most- I checked the filter. I always think that's the, one of the first things to do. Uh, air filters. Here's the filter chamber. And it's, hot, it's tough to open right now. And uh, so this furnace has a, like an oil canning thing that it does when it ends. And that's always an indication to me that the vent system has an issue and there's pretty high pressure in there. And actually, since I've owned this house, I've determined that the vent system is undersized. The return vent is. But the house does warm properly. So I'm, I'm pleased with the furnace as it is, and I look forward to someday, years ahead, that I would update it to a nice furnace system, high efficiency one like Charles does. One other thing I want to mention is that this home has a large vent here that you can see, six inch vent goes directly outside and there's another one up above right here. And that brings combustion air into this mechanical room, which uh, contains both the furnace and the hot water here. And you need that because it's not category four. You're not drawing right. air directly from the outside. You need, uh, you need uh, that combustion air. A tremendous amount of air. And yep. many houses built in, you know, say over 20 years ago in this area, do not have that combustion air supply. So basically what you're doing is you're burning air that you've already paid to heat, to heat your house. And whatever air is coming into your house is leaking in your house through uh, various defects in construction and or 
just other venting systems that exist like your bathroom vents and so on. And in the world of building science, um, we'd like to understand those things. So we also, in our business, we do uh, blower door testing, uh, uh, some, some duct testing, duct leakage testing uh, for energy efficient uh, measurements. I'm a Colorado licensed engineer as well. And we do other environmental tests for inside the home for uh, air quality as well. You know, particles, uh, melt-a-hide, uh, organic, uh, uh, other organic compounds that are coming off of your furniture and off of uh, uh, carpet products and such. We like to think about that too, because there is in this area, there's a real high concern about your environmental health in particular. So John asks, are the vent pipes stamped to what type they are? Uh, well, this, this one is a single wall, but up above it's, it's B vent and it's not stamped. Uh, but I, I know it's B vent because I've installed it plenty of times and I'm very familiar with it. Yep. Yeah. I didn't so, see a stamp on the, don't see a stamp on it. It can In be our area, C vent is B vent and we don't have a code requirement to look at a stamp on the B venting. Yeah, it can be, it can be imprinted um, into the pipe yeah. itself, but rarely do we actually need to look at that. Um, from 10 feet away, you should be able to tell the category of the furnace and what type of pipe is attached to the heating system, whether it's plastic or metal. Um, what, if you got a plastic, then you're definitely uh, category four high efficiency condensating uh, closed chamber and um, uh, kind of heating system. So um, what are the th one of the things that I actually do is, uh, you know, I can't stop myself when I walk through Home Depot, I go to the heating aisle and I take a look at all the pipes and, and the plumbing aisle and, you know, identify there. So that's kind of like a, a fun thing you can do. So John, um, yeah, you can identify it, but really you should be able to tell from about 10 feet away any kind of uh, uh, connection pipe that's attached to the heating or cooling system. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I wanted to share with you um, one thing before we go to Daniel, who's up next. Um, and so apparently there's a sequence of operation that you're all talking about. And uh, so I wrote it down for you. Um, there's a thermostat calls for heat. And if it has an inducer motor, that turns on to draw that draft. And then pressure and limit switches, uh, limit switches host, oh, for stable. problems. That's fine. And then um, he, he is disabled. Oh, we'll start. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll get it, Daniel. And then uh, hot surface igniter turns on and glows, or the electric spark igniter sparks. And then power is sent to the gas valve, which opens up and it usually clicks. And then then the burners ignite. And you just saw Mark's port shot, um, uh, the shot burners blow. And then um, the flame sensor concern, uh, confirms that there is a flame and the flames heat the exchanger and then the blower fan turns on and circulates the warm air throughout the house and a delta T is achieved. And Charles talked about uh, measuring a delta T. So let's see, Daniel's up next. So Daniel, if you're available. All right, you ready? Yep. Can you see me? We can. We can see All you. All right. So um, I'd like to expand just a little bit and take a, a bigger look at the HVAC system, starting with the building shell. So uh, when I'm with a client in the house, uh, I like to try and predict, even though we don't have to, the standards tell us that we don't have to predict how a home is going to be heated or cooled or adequately. Um, I still like to try and figure that out and see if it's going to work all right. Um, at my house here, we have south facing windows. We get a lot of sunlight in the winter time. So uh, it can be 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and we might not have the furnace kick on at all all day long because we get so much solar gain. Um, so I'd like to explain that to my client, let them know that they, that's what they can expect. Uh, when I bought this house just last year, my wife and I, the lovely Vanna White behind the camera, um, we, uh, I looked at it and I thought, man, I'm not gonna buy this house. It doesn't have any return air down low on the second level, on the lower level, it's a two level townhome. 
Uh, our only return air on this floor is here at the ceiling. And we're on a concrete slab. I thought, man, it's going to be miserable down here. We're going to be all the cold air in the house. Is, as we all know, cold air is dense and it's lazy and it just wants to sit down low. So I'm going to be sitting here in the living room. My feet will be cold and I'll be angry at my wife for making me buy this house. So um, I thought, well, maybe there's some things we can do. So one thing we did was uh, put in a cork floor over the tile floor in the kitchen. I didn't add uh, any uh, additional return air, although we have the capability here, we can come down, the unit is right above us. I will, when I, in conjunction with remodeling uh, the guest bathroom, I'm gonna bring a return air duct down here, probably a eight or 10 inch round, and right near the floor. And then in the winter time, we're gonna pull that cold air off the floor, get it back to the unit, recirculate it and send it back out. Um, let's go upstairs and look at some of the equipment. So we have our, our ducts in, embedded in the concrete. Uh, and I, uh, one thing I like to point out to my clients during the inspection is, are the register boots sealed? Especially if we have um, ducts in the floor. So I like to go in, take a look, put my camera down in the duct itself. And as we all know, we, we, there's some dangerous things that can happen in, uh, in under subfloor ducts, in uh, ducts that are embedded in concrete. We can have asbestos ducts in there. We can have rotted out metal ducts in there, or we can have um, quite often the PVC ducts that are much more impervious to, uh, okay. impervious to moisture. Um, so what I did in order to stop in training air from the gravel layer below the slab whenever the unit was, was running was to use uh, the uh, great stuff with the long metal tube and the trigger handle and seal all the register boots at the uh, slab. Uh, as I said, we don't have enough return air on this lower level and that's something that I absolutely point out to my clients. Just this morning I had an inspection of a three level townhome with inadequate low return air they're going to be miserable there in the wintertime. It's not going to be uh, warm enough in that lower level. And many of these two, three, and four level townhomes, that lower level isn't tenable in the wintertime um, because we're on a slab and because cold air is dense and sinks and we don't have the capacity to grab that cold air off the floor, send it back to the unit and uh, regurgitate it, so to speak. Uh, let's go upstairs. Here's our main return air up here. Hi, that's helpful in the uh, summertime when all the warm air is up there or in the wintertime when the convected air stays in the ceiling. However, in between cycles of heating and cooling, obviously, the air is going to stay there. And that's why more modern equipment that has more efficient um, blower motor, an ECM motor, electronically commutated motor, uh, which we can run much more frequently and constantly destratify the air send it back to the unit and send it back to, to the supply registers, that can be very helpful. In a house like this, if we had a permanent split capacitor motor, like the typical motor that you would find on most conventional furnaces, that would cost about $350 a year in electricity to run 24-7, 365. With an ECM motor, electronically commutated motor, um, that goes down by about a factor of 10, so it would be only about $35 a year to run your uh, blower motor 24-7, constantly destratifying the air and sending it back out through your supply registers. I like to tell my clients that the HVAC system is the heart and lungs of the home. It's, it's really one of the most important parts of the home and it's what's going to make you make or break your comfort and a lot of your happiness in the house. If you're miserable, if you're down on the first floor and your feet are cold in the wintertime and you have to uh, you know, put a blanket on just to watch TV, um, that's one thing if you're renting an apartment. If you're buying a house, paying a mortgage, working your tail off to, to meet, the, uh, meet the expenses, uh, that can really stick in your craw. According to the National Association of Realtors survey uh, done a little while ago, 25% of people who buy houses uh, are sorry they bought that house. And what we try and do in our little company is make sure that we give them enough information so that 
the condition of the home is not one of those reasons that they're sorry that they bought a house. Okay, so this is a two level townhouse. It's probably about uh, 2,500 square feet or so. We saw the inadequate um, return air on the lower level. Now here's our guest bedroom. We have a supply, but no return. So it's a really good thing to have return air in every separate habitable room. So what I will do, again, we just moved in here last fall, is put transfer grills here over the door, one low, one high to muffle the sound a little bit. And uh, so that when we close our doors at night, we're not over pressurizing the room and forcing our conditioned air into nooks and crannies and leakage around the windows and stuff where it could condense and create a problem. Uh, there's a fire safety uh, a mnemonic kind of like stop, drop and roll. And uh, the, that a saying is close before you doze. So it's a good idea to close your bedroom doors at night to uh, increase your fire safety. And again, if you close your door at night, you're pushing air into a room with a supply register, but you're not drawing it back out with a return register. You, you're creating a, a positive pressure in there and uh, it's not good for energy efficiency. Uh, here's the actual equipment itself. And again, getting back to the kind of the, um, the concept of the HVAC, the, the HVAC as part of a system, we talked a little bit about solar orientation here and the benefits uh, it brings us in the wintertime. Um, a big part of any house uh, is the attic. The attic, if, if uh, you talk to any weatherization contractors, they'll tell you that um, when you're trying to save energy in a home, you do A, B, C, right? So attic is number one because attic, a home has what we all know as the stack effect. Air wants to travel vertically up and out. And that's the air that we're paying to heat and cool. It's also air that's laden with moisture. If we allow that up into the attic, we not only lose that money that we spent heating and cooling it, but we also create that risk for condensation in the attic. The way to avoid that is to put our thumb on the straw. And I had uh, a local weatherization company come in. They put uh, insulated covers on every single uh, can light. They sealed all the uh, gaps in the partition walls at the, at the wall plates. Every single penetration, plumbing, vent piping, conduit, everything sealed it perfectly. Installed baffles all the way around and gave me about 12 inches of cellulose on top of the existing fiberglass bats. And it's made an incredible difference here. So I made sure I did that before I had my contractor come in and put a new furnace in. Because obviously when you do those kind of weatherization improvements, it's gonna change our heating and cooling mode. And we don't wanna oversize our equipment. As we all know, oversizing of the equipment is, can be even worse than undersizing. If we oversize our air conditioners, we end up with the kind of situation where um, it runs for a short period of time, gets the air very cold, brings our, uh, satisfies our thermostat, but doesn't run long enough to pull what the HVAC contractors call latent or uh, humidity out of the air. There's not enough contact time with our return air across the uh, evaporator coil to wring that moisture out of the air. And these are all things that I like to look at. In addition to the more technical things about how the, the unit is operating, I like to look at the furnace in the context of the whole building shell, the windows, the attic. And I didn't finish that ABC concept of weatherization. So after the attic, then basement. We don't have a basement here, but in a typical house with a basement, you want to then, after you've done your uh, weatherization in the attic, your insulating, air sealing, and ventilation, you want to focus your energies on the basement because the rim joist areas are very, very leaky. We have a lot of different uh, framing joints there. And the typical, uh, which is still code compliant, believe it or not, just a rectangle of fiberglass shoved in there doesn't work very well. So um, it's nice to, to foam those or to cut in blocks of uh, rigid board insulation and, and cough those into place. So um, a couple months ago, I had a friend of mine, HVAC contractor, come out. He took out the 20-year-old carrier 80 percenter and put in uh, high-efficiency sealed combustion. This is 97 percent efficient, I believe. We uh, this was where the furnace. Uh, I'm sorry, no, this is where combustion air came in for the 
combustion room. We closed that off. And this is where we took our exhaust out into the attic and up through a uh, roof mounted uh, uh, roof mounted penetration. That's where our PVC pipe ends up. And as you know, every, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's totally wrong. This was the uh, makeup air duct for this combustion air zone. We added a Y here and then tapped in for combustion air. So this just goes up above the insulation layer and it pulls our combustion air from the attic, not from outside, from the attic, which is huge and, and probably 14 feet tall to peak, and supplies our combustion air for our sealed combustion furnace. The vent pipe goes out here up through a roof mounted uh, roof jack, neoprene roof jack. Uh, we installed uh, a high efficiency air filter, which I see Charlie has, and I think uh, Mark too. Um, these are great. I try and convince all my clients to switch to these instead of the one inch cartridge filter. Uh, a one inch cartridge filter is either going to give you good airflow or good dust capture. It really can't do both. Uh, only a, a pleated media filter like this, the nice big ones, can provide that good dust capture and good airflow. There's a couple th things here that um, that my contractor did that eventually I'm gonna to have to change and these guys who are really sharp have already seen it. One is this is not a proper drip leg, right? You have to you have to have a change of direction. This is a proper drip leg here, right? Because the gas is coming down and then particles go straight down into the into the uh, extension, into the nipple before they come into the gas valve. Here we have our gas flowing this way, and there's really nothing that's gonna make the particles or moisture drop down here. That's, that's incorrect. Another incorrect thing that he did, <clears throat> just out of expediency, um, was to use a flex connector here. That's totally forbidden. Uh, the final hookup to a permanently installed appliance has to be hard pipe. However, this is such a smooth, quiet uh, unit that there's no vibration here. It's got a rubber grommet. Um, there's really no danger to it, but eventually I will change it to metal. Um, not only does the unit have an ECM air handler or blower motor, it also has an ECM uh, uh, inducer motor. So it's super quiet and uh, it, the difference in efficiency and cost and comfort is incredible. Uh, ben, are you still yep. with me? Yep. Okay. Um, Is it, so, so where's the condensate go? Do you have a condensate pump or a drain? No, oh, it's a floor drain. And it's shared with the uh, water heater drip pan and the washing machine drip pan, and it all comes into one uh, floor drain. And I see a catch pan underneath the condensing furnace. Yeah, he made a custom pan in his shop. And uh, I, this is a little pet peeve of mine. I, I hate seeing, feeling all the cold air and hot air blowing out of uh, untrapped um, condensate drain pipe. So I had him put in the nice um, pre-made trap. Uh, one th another thing that really shouldn't be in this uh, house, but we have it and maybe I'll eventually change it, is a bypass humidifier. So in our temperature, like you guys in Colorado, it does get dry in the winter time. And it's not only more comfortable to have humidity in the air, it's also healthier. As they've uh, found out recently with the COVID virus, um, when there's adequate humidity in the air, it gives viruses, bacteria, and, and mold uh, spores something to plate onto and fall out, in the, uh, fall out from the air. When air is super dry, those type of little tiny, very fine particles stay suspended longer. So humidity is important for a couple of reasons. Now, this one is a bypass humidifier, as we all know, that works on a pressure differential between the supply and the return side, pushing uh, the, the moisture across the humidifier element. In a house like this, where we have two levels and only one unit and not really great uh, return air setup, this ideally would be the a uh, type of humidifier with the little electric fan here that doesn't steal air from 
the um, from the supply in yep. order to push that moisture into the airstream. Yep. Um, well, Daniel, I really yeah. appreciate it, man. I re I like your approach on uh, the building science approach to inspecting the heart and lungs, the lungs really of the of so, the house. Sorry, I can get I can talk about this stuff forever, as you can tell. So no, sorry that's okay. That's okay. I appreciate it. Rob, I think you're up next and then we'll go to Charles. I can see he's all set up to do a carbon monoxide test on the outside of his heating system. Rob? Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. Um, I guess my job being fourth is, uh, is a little bit like the closer, or the wrap up guy. <laughs> and so uh, my, my colleagues have done a masterful job talking about some of the idiosyncrasies and, and, and technical aspects of the uh, of the home inspection and the furnace inspection, and and I wanted to, I wanted to summarize a little bit of that if I could, Ben. But I also want to want to want to add a couple of twists. One, Charlie talked about dial thermometers. Uh, here at the Brick Kicker, we have offices all across the country. Everybody uses dial thermometers for furnaces. Uh, you know, it's a simple delta check. You know, every furnace is is got a portal. You know, in this particular furnace, uh, I have a hole here in the in the cold air plenum, and I can always find a seam up in the up in the warm air side. Do a delta check. My goal in, in 30 years of experience is everything I do is replicatable. Somebody else can do the exact same thing I did. I try not to be technically exhaustive with such fancy equipment. That oh look your equipment measured to this PPM and all oh, this equipment measured to this PPM, you found a gas leak. I didn't find a gas leak. Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, if I take a temperature check across the system, take a simple picture of the thermometer and say, this one's there and this one's there and do the math. I went to public school. I can, I can subtract a little bit. And if I come up with that math being, being higher, it's like going to Vegas. If it says between 40 and 70 Delta works, 71 fails just simple as that you don't get a you don't get 22 and they go well you almost won and so that's what i do but uh so i do that <laughs> but what's also interesting at like like dan does and like charlie does is they walk their clients through these systems i'll tell my clients to take the cover off these things stare it down here at, at a high efficiency furnace in the condensate you see moisture call a tech just as simple as that I see rust, I see scale, I'm going to put on my report. But you let your clients know where their pitfalls are, you're good to go. You can, you can move on from there. I'm going to take this thing off the tripod real quick to show a couple of more tricks. Um, every furnace, and I don't care how old or how new it is, they've got this heat exchanger inside of this apparatus. And there's typically some form of insulation. That insulation is between the heat exchanger and the outer cabinet. And so when I have this thing fully running, it's in full operation, it's doing its job, I should be able to massage this furnace. It's weird, it's kinky, but it's something that you, you train your clients to do this, they can do this every time they change their furnace filter. Get this thing running, they should be able to touch every square centimeter of the outer wall of the cabinet of their furnace on the three sides that are not the business end of this furnace. And if they touch a hot spot, you know, and, and you don't have to go to your spouse, you don't have to go to your neighbor, you don't have to get, does this feel hot? Hot's pronounced. And if you feel that hot spot, you're gonna know you got a problem with your furnace. And so your clients can just simply walk over to the furnace when it's running and give it a little massage. And by, by doing that, they'll probably identify the issue much before their tech. Now, you asked, uh, you asked Dan earlier about a condensation pipe pump. There's our pump. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a nice, simple condensation pump. It's hooked up to the, to the electric of the system, and it's, it's there to, to design because we do not have a floor drain anywhere near this furnace. It catches the condensation of the air conditioner, and it catches the condensation of, of the furnace. And so we'll look, we'll look for the operation of that. But my big thing for us is is all these fancy tools, most of the technicians don't carry them. Most, uh, most others don't. Your, your Raytech, which is like the least technical tool we own, 
it's not designed to take shiny surfaces. And so, so it doesn't work. Now, I could do a hand check. I could, I could check my, e, my E5, and I could take a beautiful picture of, of the hot spot, but your hand, your hand is all you need. And so, so I wanted to kind of show, you know, everybody else has done such a wonderful job of, of looking at that stuff. I wanted to show the layman's point of view, the, the touch it, measure it, and uh, take pictures of what you did. Awesome. Uh, did we have a couple questions? You want to take a question, Rob? I'd love to. Or anybody, actually. Um, and then we'll, we'll check out Charles. Um, so do you use a, a CO detector? And what <coughs> I don't. No. I, I don't. Um, you know, it, 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 I'm in Illinois. And, and Illinois is a very unique space. When, uh, when we went and got our licenses uh, in, in 2000, the plumbers got in the middle of it. And so we're not allowed to inspect plumbing. We can observe it, we can inspect it. So we can take a gas analyzer, but the, ch the challenge with carbon monoxide testing is there's so many different monitors out there, there's so many different calibration tools out there, where, you, like I say, where you might test one today with this piece of equipment, the next piece of equipment doesn't read that, that exact calibration. And so in, in my 30 years of experience, I've found issues with my equipment that my, the gas company might not find because their equipment's a different brand than my equipment. So, so no, I typically don't. But however, uh, an interesting tool, because I, like I like to make my stuff very visual, your phone case and a simple flame mirror. I can take a picture of escaping flue gas hmm. from a natural draft diverter by looking at the cloud, right? And I can take that picture and say, Flue gas is escaping. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's flue gas. Yeah. Yep. Uh, another question from Jeff. Uh, he asks, when you have a gas or propane uh, fired furnace, do you use a gas leak detector? I, we all carry them. I, 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 have, I have one right here. Um, yep. we, yes. We, we, we try to look for them. We're, we're, we're not going to be perfect. Uh, I think the only thing perfect is bubbles and soap. Um, but but uh, we do try to invest. There's so much hidden pipe in our house that you're not going to find every gas leak. But I think a good home inspector ought to be looking for them. Yep. And Rob, you, uh, you, you're part of the Brick Kicker franchise, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So if uh, I want to... Uh, you know, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we have franchises coast to coast. Um, we've, uh, we've been involved with InterNACHI for, for, for many, many years now. Um, we're always looking for, for new great teammates to be on our, be on our team. But we, we, we are from Washington to Florida and from Vermont to Southern California. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Charles, you're up. My pleasure. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I did come outside. And basically, this is where my air conditioning units are located at. And also my exhaust for my furnace. Um, we're on a nest. So I did go ahead and fire everything up. So we're calling for heat. One of the things that we do, and this is, you know, it's not required by any standards that I know of anywhere. Um, we just found that this is the best way to find bad furnaces. So we use Testos. Uh, we have 330s and 310s. These are like little tanks that we use and they last for a long time. They're battery operated. So right here's the furnace for my, I'm sorry, the exhaust for my furnace. This is my intake. There's a pipe and a pipe here. So what I do is we have to use undiluted air and we come onto it and I'm gonna get this thing running. Let's see if I can get close enough to show numbers. I may not be able to yeah. Let's go with the light. Can you see any certain numbers? You pull it back a little bit. There. All right, we'll hold it and I'll stretch. Um, so right now it's normal when these things start up, especially if it hasn't been used, that it's going to spike up. We know that there's 21% oxygen in the air. Fire, if it's a good gas mixture, we're going to use anywhere from 10 to 15. So I should be left with anywhere around 5 to 10% uh, of oxygen. 
the ASHRAE standards, you know, you'll get some people say that carbon monoxide can't be higher than 100, can't be higher than 200. These little machines will both measure the carbon monoxide that we're exhausting. You can see the bottom number keeps dropping. I personally like it under 10, but there's nothing that I can find anywhere that proves that that's what it is. But I've seen these things tuned so well. Um, we go with 100 is our magic number. And anytime it's over that, we're gonna bring in a heating contractor, tell them and that there's a clue. So everything is a clue. There's nothing that's guaranteed. That water that I mentioned before, underneath the, the blower fan on the floor, that's a clue or an indicator, all right? With this thing here, oxygen levels, if they're too high, and if you think about it, I got a burner and then it goes through the heat exchanger, if I have a hole in that heat exchanger, it's going to add in additional oxygen after the fire. So that's going to go ahead and get that level up there. We can also scroll through a few other readings on here. Let's see what we got. So this is my temperature that's coming out. We're at 82 or 84 degrees. You know, and like I said, we're using 95% of the heat. What's kind of hard to realize is that that vent pipe that Rob mentioned that you should be touching or the, and that's only on high efficiencies, mind you, it is going to be really hot on the mid efficiencies, but that's going to actually be cooler than the ductwork that goes through it. Hmm. So we scroll through back here. And then this is going to the top number now that 21 hmm. is showing my uh, air free. So that's calculating if this furnace was in a 100% oxygen environment, it would be producing 21 uh, parts per million of carbon monoxide. So we'll leave that back at the oxygen. This can also calculate and tell me exactly what efficiency we're running at. So this thing says 98.1. So it's running nice and clean. What else we got here? There's my delta T, but I usually don't use that one because if I'm outside like here, it's gonna give me the difference between the vent pipe and the outdoor air. That doesn't help me too much. The excess air is big. Um, this is another one of our clues. That needs to be under 100%. So right now we're at 64%. It's a calculation. It figures out the carbon uh, dioxide. It figures out the oxygen and other NOx gases, what it should be. And if we're getting too much fresh air after the fire, then that's gonna start shooting up. So if I get over 100, I get water on the bottom, high levels of O2, or if I get extreme high levels of carbon monoxide, and I've had these things showing where we're exhausting like 2,000 parts per million, something is wrong, you know, and it just gives us a clue to bring somebody out there. But something I should add on, a lot of our heating contractors around here don't use equipment like this. And because of which, you know, they come out there and they're going to bring a, a kid up you know, carbon monoxide detector in the house and they're gonna turn it on and they're gonna go see no carbon monoxide. You may not be producing carbon monoxide in the house, but that doesn't make the furnace safe. So we thoroughly push on, and we have a few heating contractors that use equipment like this. So we know that they're gonna back up what we say. Hmm. Any questions on that? Or? Well, um, so what is your opinion about home inspectors using specialized tools and going way beyond the standards of practice? Because that's, you know, uh, home inspectors, we don't hardly measure a thing. And you're using a device that measures and quantifies certain things. And then you have to evaluate what you're, what you're measuring. What, what, what would you say about that? And you're asking me a very personal question and how we run our business. And I think we should, you know, and I believe in it. Um, we market differently. We don't market to real estate agent. We market direct to consumer. And because of which we spend a lot of mar money in our marketing and we use more tools, more equipment than anyone else. But that's the reason that people choose us. So we keep six inspectors busy and we're actually looking to hire more. So if there's anybody who does want to go in depth on doing their home inspections, then please give me a call and we'll see if there's a good fit. And, you know, uh, would you all consider that to be the case that it's okay? It's really a personal call to exceed the standards of practice, Rob, Dan, Mark. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Totally. 
I admire Charles and what he does. Uh, and I take exception with some of the uh, home inspector insurance companies who say never go beyond the standards. We go beyond the standards all the time. Uh, a couple of things that I didn't get a chance to show is one is an anim animometer for uh, quantifying airflow at the registers, both supply and return, and the other is thermal imaging to make sure that we don't have blocked ducts, disconnected ducts, uh, we don't have excessive heat loss up in a plenum or something. Um, I'm all for it. And uh, I've known that Charlie has done this for a while and it's something that, uh, you know, I, I don't want need to be the best inspector in the world, but I don't want anybody better than me. And if Charlie's doing something that's better than I'm doing, well, I'm going to pay real close attention. So, well, I don't know what your experience are, uh, your experiences are, uh, but like when I was doing home inspections for the first time, 25, seven years ago, um, we didn't have any devices. We had a flashlight and a GFCI right. tester, maybe. Now we have all this equipment, so I would uh, rec I wouldn't hesitate in, in grabbing an infrared camera like Rob has to check out the the, the temperature of the ductwork at the surface. Myself, I have every tool that has been shown here. I've just been really holding back. <laughs> <laughs> we have a um, a question about heat pumps. If anybody wants it, would you test a heat pump in the summer or or not? Absolutely. So uh, you know, the, the only, <clears throat> we test heat pumps. We don't have a lot of heat pumps in this marketplace, but if, if a heat pump's working in the summer, it's going to work in the winter. Uh, the only difference really is, is that, you know, is, is that, is, is that transfer. Yeah. And so we've always, we've always taken to the point, if I test the heat pump in the summer mode, the only difference would be in, in our climate and, and, and Charlie and Dan would, would, would attest to this, the only difference is our heat pumps are typically attached to some other supplemental heating, either a gas forced air or electric forced air. So we would want to test the emergency heat as well. But on my report, I would log, I tested in the heat mode or I tested in the air conditioning mode. Yep. And there's always that 65 degree temperature uh, limit where, you know, you get a little, you know, uh, a lot of inspectors, if it's cold outside, they don't do anything like turn on the air conditioner. But I personally haven't found that written anywhere. That 65 degree. It's always been a general rule of thumb written by um, an opinion by somebody. Yeah. Well, and, and the other funny thing is, is that, and I bet we could take a poll between the six of us, Ben. What is the exact temperature delta across an air conditioning to work? Because you can, <laughs> you can go to 15 different books and get nine different answers. And yeah, you know, and opinions are like uh, like other things. Everybody's got one, and uh, uh, you know, so you you just gotta hold your guns, pick your number, and let's go. Yep. <laughs> and uh, in in some of our courses, uh, there's one particular course, the building science course, and the healthy homes course. We have a healthy homes program. We teach how the um, Daniel talked about this, how the the insufficient or deficient amount of insulation and lack of air sealing can actually have an effect on the heating system and its efficiency. So you may be a home inspector who comments upon the entire performance of the heating system and its efficiency, but actually what you're actually doing is talking about the system that was installed. The efficiency of the heating system, maybe Daniel can talk about this, actually is affected by the entire house. Right? It could be a 95% efficient heating system or cooling system, but if, the, if there's no air sealing or weather, uh, weatherization, that system isn't, is no longer that efficient. Would right. you agree? Absolutely, and even the ductwork right, has an impact on efficiency. Right. Those efficiency ratings are done in laboratories with zero static drop, and you're never gonna duplicate that in the house, so there's always some reduction in efficiency. In you know, I saw on your ductwork um, some gray stuff at the seams. Yeah, I went a little wild with it. <laughs> so, so uh, what about uh, uh, the other gray stuff? Duct tape. Yours is mastic. What about duct I tape? I love mastic. Uh, I think it works so much better. It's easier to apply. It doesn't peel off. We've all seen the duct tape, peel, even the good stuff, the UL label stuff, peeling off because the installer's not going to take the time to prep the uh, duct work to get the dust off, to get the uh, oils off, so. 
Uh, we have a question from Narius. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name, Narius. With all this equipment involved when inspecting systems, how much time do you guys spend on a regular home? You're pulling out all these equipment and huge tool belts, I imagine you guys each <laughs> have. Um, is this just adding extra time? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Oops, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, Charlie, you and I could probably go, uh, you know, play ping pong with this one for an hour and a half, uh, you know, you know, on, on it. Um, you know, it, it really depends on experience, Ben. You know, and, and I'll let you know. I, I know for me, I might move more effectively through a home after after thirty years and twelve thousand inspections than somebody that's been doing it for for two years and seven hundred inspections. Yeah, you know, and, and so I'll, I'll let Charlie answer it, but I'm not adding any more time. I'm being more effective with my time. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not as efficient with my time. So we've actually changed things and we decided that we're only gonna do one inspection a day. Wow. And we only do them in the mornings. We are, and we've been doing this now for two years. So only one a day, only in the mornings. We're on site on average at least three hours. Um, we've been known to be on site for five hours. Real estate agents don't like that very much, by the way. <laughs> um, but our clients do, all right? And we make that pretty clear up front what's going to happen. And then we do the reports in the afternoon. And that does not include writing reports on, on site. We only take photos. We only talk to our clients. Then when we leave, we write our reports and we get them to them by evening. So are your fees uh, in accordance with that extra time? Are you able to charge significantly higher fees than most inspectors? I don't know. I guess it's who you compare it to. I think you, me, Mike Spigarin, I think we're all kind of pretty close together on our fees. But there's also people out there charging around $300. Here in the Chicagoland right. area, a basic, you know, our lowest fee is about 500 is what we're charging and you know what our guys are happy i'm happy and we're with the families in the evenings so even in these hectic times because we're losing i want to say i lose maybe seven now we're up to about seven to ten jobs a day that we're not able to do because we're a week out and i'm okay with that you know it's it is what it is so we're picky about the people that come and work with us and and we work for those reviews as crazy as it sounds. So Charles, you're saying that you're booked out a week in advance yeah, and people want right. inspections quick. I can't do it. Yeah. We're, they're scheduling with us right now. We're scheduling Tuesday, Wednesday next week. So what do you do? I mean, this is off the webinar topic, but what do you do in that situation? Do you hand it over to a friendly competitor? Um, no. Maybe I should figure out something like that. I'm a, I really believe that most of, and, and please forgive me, I'm not trying to be insulting to anybody, but this profession, our clients expect us to be a plumber, electrician, heating contractor, roofer, window installer, every other trade that's out there. You know, and I know when we all go to our 60 hour classes and that's is not criticizing the the trainers, we've done it for nearly 20 years and I know Rob has and other people too. It's just that you can't learn all those trades and all that knowledge in 60 hours or 77 hours. And then you listen to us spew for five field events and then poof, you know, you're a highly trained professional out there helping everybody with the biggest purchase of their lives. It just doesn't happen. So, you know, it's hard for me you know, I know that my competitors or the, the people that we count as competitors, they're booked up too, you know. So I don't know what else I could do. I am looking for other people, but we do expect our people to know quite a bit. We want to be able to go toe to toe with a heating guy, a plumber, an electrician, and so forth. So it's, it's what we look for. So. Rob, you got a question, but Charles, you run a school, right? What's the name of the school? Um, we it's called Bellman Group. We did not renew our license in Illinois yet, um, but we decided that we are going to go ahead and get our license, and I'm in the process of working on it now. So we've been hey, doing it since 2002. Rob, you want so, to say something? Yeah, to, you know, to, 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 to dovetail on what, what Charlie was saying, and 
in this marketplace, we're because of COVID, we're we're all in the middle of the March market now, and it's June, and so everybody's busy. and And Charlie said it really, really well. We're all working for the reviews, and 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 like everything else, everybody's doing this to find who's best. And uh, and unfortunately, in the marketplace, we can't use. Nick's philosophy from Picasso, you know, you know, and, and the old saying of, you know, hey, you know, this is ten thousand dollars for the autograph, you know, but really it only took you a second, you know. I'm I'm thirty years. Charlie's twenty five or twenty seven years. I know you're twenty five or twenty seven years, Ben. I know Dan's that long as well. Unfortunately, the marketplace does dictate a little bit where our thresholds are, but. What what really can predicate and what people need to understand is you can't you can't be afraid to speak up. And so for for a business like Charlie's, who's booking out for Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week, if the client wants Charlie, they're gonna go get an extension on their contract because hmm. everybody's in the same boat. I know I know my regulars. I mean, I you know I, I I'm not saying what, what you know anything about anything. I try, we try to do three jobs a day for our guys at, at our operation, our 19 guys. Um, that's, that's how they're able to be compensated the way I do. I only do one. Uh, I, I've already done my 15,000 square foot this morning um, in, in my industrial building. But that's, that's neither here nor there. If I have a, a, a client that wants me, I'm already booked out through next Thursday. And they'll just go get an extension to make sure if they want me, that's what they're doing. I know that's what Charlie's doing. I'm sure that's what Dan is doing too, because the market is just that flooded right now with the consumers and the demand for the home inspector is very, 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 uh, very strong. Hey, uh, getting back to the topic, uh, Julie yes. is asking, and a couple of other uh, folks are asking about the air filters. Um, I think it was Dan's or someone's air filter was uh, leaning over. Maybe it was Mark's. It was that no, it was Dan's. Right. It, it was Dan's, and yeah. I can. And what Dan said was that filters, uh, either you're going to sacrifice flow or filtration. And filtration, the higher the filtration is on a one-inch filter, the less flow you're going to have. And uh, Dan was, he's still here. He can comment on that himself. And the angle, you see a lot of filters positioned that way because there's not a proper mounting channel in the in the furnace. Or it actually adds to the, the surface area. Of the filtration to lean them over like that if they're set up properly. Hmm. Is Dan still here? He can speak to his filter. Yeah, that was the housing. So um, sometimes if you don't have enough room to put one in in true vertical position, you can buy a different. Uh, that's an Air Bear Tryon housing specifically made to have the filter on that angle, and it's it's gasketed right. So there's the squishy foam gasket to prevent filter bypass, which yeah. is kind of is important. Hey, one more question, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, have you ever said anything to kill the deal? Um, maybe related to the heating system. You can, you can comment on if you had ever said something about the entire house, other systems, but maybe the heating system in particular, like if it didn't turn on or if it, if it was a, a low efficiency, 60% natural draft what, something, and then you tagged what, it. Wouldn't that be expectational, Ben? You know, that's <laughs> not really, you know, it, it, it's my job. Yeah. You know, I tell my clients this very succinctly. <laughs> I didn't come here yesterday and break it. Uh, I, I, showed, I showed up here this morning at 11 o'clock central time to talk about this furnace that's right here. And all I'm going to do is tell you about it. And, and, and I'm going to give you everything I know about it. And then I'm going home. What you decide is up to you. <laughs> yeah. And if we just, no, go ahead, Dan. No, please, Charles. So we just got an old phrase, everything really boils down to how much and who pays. So we can help somebody identify about how much something costs, but it's really our client's decision whether or not they want to accept it. And every market is different. Right now, it's such a seller's market and these houses are moving so fast and there's multiple bids and people are just accepting whatever they're accepting, right. uh, no matter what I say, and they're still going to buy it. You know, yeah. But I don't really, honestly, is is Heartless as it sounds, I don't care if they buy it or not. Uh, what I do care is that they know what they're buying. Right, exactly. Yep. Actually, yeah, I, hope, I, 
I hope they don't buy it. So they call me next week and I get to see him again. <laughs> That's the Tom Corbett theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, fellas, I really appreciate it. Uh, that was really great. Um, we're going to try to do that again sometime. Um, I know you took a uh, precious time out of your busy life and uh, business life to do something that I really highly appreciate, which is when you have an experienced inspector sharing what he or she knows. Um, and that's, that's really uh, special uh, in this time, day and time. So it was really great for you guys to do that. I really appreciate it out of the bottom of my heart. And thank Thanks you for, for having me too. It's an yeah, honor. You. you got it. Hey, everybody stay safe and healthy and I'll see you back online. Uh, Charles, Mark, Daniel, Rob, I really appreciate it again. Everybody, see you later. Bye. Adios, mate.